I'll talk about local perceptions of of tenure in um, in both uh, in two sites where we've been working. Now, this is work that's uh, again uh, contributed by the the whole group, and the title is "A View from the Inside: Forest Communities' Perceptions of Tenure Security in Selected Sites in Indonesia." Um, again, just to show that. Um, uh, many, the many partners we're engaged with. Um, and Calupsia is actually the, the acronym for the project, Collaborative Land Use Planning and Sustainable Institutional Arrangements, which is really the vision. Um, I'll begin real quick just to talk, talking about our objectives. Then I'll provide, uh, Nining has done a good job of talking about the study setting, so I'll just also uh, breeze through that. I'll mention some of the uh, methods that we used, and I'll go into the findings and uh, some, make some concluding remarks of which it would be helpful. Uh, you know, I think I'll end up with questions, and that, that will be the, the basis of our discussions. Okay, so our objective is really to try and identify local forest resource tenure and resource management systems, and in particular to get a sense of um, local perceptions of tenure security, given the things that are happening um, around uh, people. And some of the questions we're trying to ask is, what are the property rights and tenure arrangements um, that regulate access and use of forests? What are the roles and responsibilities of different actors, um, especially the actors at the local level? We are focusing very much on forest-adjacent communities. And then what, what are some of the fa things that constrain access and use? Um, and in particular, what are people's perceptions of, of tenure um, security? Now, this is all part of the land use planning process. And clearly, um, tenure is actually central um, to, to land use planning and one would imagine that it, 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 it makes a lot of sense to try and get um, a sense of you know, what are the key interests in, in land and in resources during a process of, of, of planning. So the setting is as Nining had shown in West Kalimantan and in central Malukas. Uh, so that's Kalimantan and Seram Island is around there. So this is just the location um, of, of the project within the broader um, Asia region, Southeast Asia. Um, so just to talk a little bit about um, Seram Island, what, what um, as indicated here, it comprises quite a huge proportion. Oops, what did I just do? a huge proportion of, a, large, a, a relatively large part of it is a national park. Um, population density is pretty low, about 15.2 inhabitants per square kilometer. Um, generally, in Indonesia, I think it's 128 people per square kilometer. So this is pretty low density area. And the main, um, uh, economic activities, uh, agriculture, and fisheries. Now, these are the sites where we collected our data from. Each of those yellow spots is, is a village. So there are about 20 villages that we worked in. Uh, but the purpose of this is also to show you that there are quite a number of issues, um, conflictual issues that have a bearing on tenure. In, in and around the villages. So for example, there is uh, some issues of conflict of access for people between people and the national park authorities. Um, similarly here we have again issues about oil palm expansion plantations. Um, uh, again in this, in this region um, the issues of, again, conflict over land with the Manusela National Park. So all around where our villages are, uh, are 
there are certain issues with regards to uh, development, plantation development um, uh, for oil palm, for cocoa, but also the long-standing issues with the Manusela National Park. Okay. Um, now, this is a Kapuas Hulu site. Again, um, uh, a, 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 an even larger part of it comprises uh, protected areas, two national parks and, and forest reserves. The population density is even lower at seven persons per kilometer square. And the main source of uh, uh, revenue and incomes are agriculture, fishing, but also um, uh, forestry, timber and non-timber forest products. Now, again, the areas we work in, there are increasingly um, issues about oil palm plantation expansion, mining. The mining industry is also big there, gold mining. And so these are just uh, some of the um, key development uh, issues that affect forestry in the region, and that potentially could affect um, uh, could affect people's uh, forest adjacent communities access. In terms of method, um, those villages we selected uh, about 20 villages uh, randomly selected. We conducted a series of household surveys, which I won't be reporting on today. We also did key in informant interviews. Um, but I'll present the results of focus group discussions, which were conducted amongst, in, in all, you know, 20 villages in Saram and 20 in Kapuas Hulu, and the focus groups were disaggregated by gender and age with 35 years as the cutoff. Um, <clears throat> so we have a total of about 120, and each group, each focus group averaged about six um, individuals. Um, so what, what did we find? Um, in terms of forest use, of course, um, diverse uses of forest by people, okay? And the uses uh, span from sources of income, uh, daily subsistence, but also cultural uses, especially in Siram, where you even have um, sacred groves and burial sites, which are protected and set aside. But importantly also, people talked about um, the environmental services that these, um, the forests that they use, the, 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 that they take care of, use and manage, um, provide, including um, disaster prevention um, and and clean water. So clearly, uh, multiple users for the different users at the local level. And this just shows you, this uh, slide is really a, just a table showing what, are the di what the different users people have. So there are wood-based products, there's firewood, timber, and leaves for, and, and thatch as well as rattan. Um, non-timber forest products from medicinal plants, honey, etc. But also they hunt game, which you saw over there. Now, in terms of forest management, there does appear to be broad participation um, in, in managing. And there are different management functions here from protecting uh, borders, which are it's a responsibility, to enforcing rules, to monitoring compliance, uh, resolving conflicts, um, and, 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 and sanctioning. And if you will note that on this side, this is the Saram, oops, there, right there, and that is for Kapuas Hulu. Um, the table shows who does what of these different functions. And in both cases, villages are involved and their leaders. But in the Saram Island case, what you will find is that there, is, there appears to be some kind of cooperation between officials, between external actors in enforcement, in, in the different management functions, as opposed to Kapuas Hulu, 
where the management functions are concentrated with local you know, level actors, both villagers and their customer, the customary authorities that, are, uh, that authorize use. Again, um, in terms of rights and access, what we find is that <clears throat> for the shared forests, um, for the village forests, because there seems to be two categories of, of uh, okay, thanks, Nining, um, the shared forests and land parcels for cultivation. Again, we do find that people have withdrawal and management rights. They can harvest products. They are able to have responsibilities for protection and management <coughs> um, on, on shared forests. But they also have land parcels for cultivation. And this is through inheritance. Um, uh, the, you know, the land is passed through inheritance across different generations. So what are the source, where do these rights come from? Overwhelmingly, uh, the respondents talked about um, customary rights as authorizing their access and use, and, and customary authority as being at the head of, of, of uh, you know, being at the forefront of regulating their use. Um, they also talked about geographical proximity and, and, and also indicated that clans, you know, these, these are, the rights are exclusive to people living there and who are also members of different clan and kinship groups. Uh, what's interesting is that there's a general unawareness of, um, you know, of some of these regulations that are coming from the top down. I think Moira uh, did a good job of, pro, you know, indicating that a lot of um, the forests are supposedly state-owned, but people do think and they believe that they're the, the, the genuine and rightful owners with very little um, knowledge of their, those, that there are other laws of which they are subject, except for those who live in direct, uh, very close to national parks and other protected areas. Um, in terms of tenure security, most people uh, perceive that their rights and access will not be violated now or into the future. Um, but, and, and they believe they will continue enjoying access to forests under these customary um, authority and rights that they have enjoyed over time. Families will continue to have their own plots for cultivation and they'll continue to access the shared forests and they also believe that the, the forest areas that they have are vast and that customary restrictions will, <laughs> will maintain that. But however, they do um, indicate that there are certain, you know, things that are happening like oil palm plantation, mining, national parks, and they do see opportunities such as, um, you know, involving more stakeholders in management and the issue about having some clarity between household land and forest areas. Um, since I'm running out of time, I think I'll just go ahead and make my concluding remarks. It seems then that there are, like any other forest anywhere in the world, there are multiple uses and multiple values that people have for their forests. Um, Clearly, uh, customary authority is really strong. It is legitimate, um, and it is respected, and people comply with, with the rules. Uh, in, in Saram, in particular, in one part, we did see some, a lot of interaction between um, officials and, uh, and, and customary authority in terms of monitoring, and also with regard to sanction, okay? So there, there was a lot of uh, interaction between those two um, organizations, which I think is, is very interesting, because mostly um, customer and state are usually in, in contestation as opposed to being in cooperation. Um, so overall, villages tend to believe their, their rights are secure, regardless 
of the things that are happening around them, which, which I think, uh, to me, I think that's really interesting coming out of this, and it's one of the puzzles um, that we, we still need to think about. Why would people who are confronted with different kinds of things, conflictual, which may have um, impact on their access in future, why would they perceive and believe that um, their rights are secure? We're still trying to think about this, uh, but I think we'll still go back to the issue that they still have, pretty much have access um, as they did uh, before. So these things that are happening haven't yet completely disrupted or violated their rights, but meaning might say something different because of an example in Siram. Moreover, they do not perceive scarcity, and so they're not yet competing for resources. Okay, these are still questions that we're asking. And importantly, they continue to receive benefits, um, streams from the resources, uh, as, as they expect. But then the question is, does this disconnect that, you know, first of all, is it real? Is it a figment of my imagination? But even, but even if, it is still, if it is there, does it really matter that there is a disconnect? Okay, I don't know, and what, what exactly is at stake? Some scholars have, uh, you know, say that, uh, property rights scholars, uh, num a number of them say that, uh, people's perceptions are the best indicator uh, of, of, of insecurity. But others say uh, that um, this has to be combined with the so-called objective uh, measures of, of security, which includes issues about enforcement, about just and fair conflict resolution, about the clarity of rights. So, you know, I'd be interested to know your thoughts um, on, on, you know, on, on how to think about this disconnect and whether it really matters um, at all, uh, although I, I would pose that it does. Um, I think that's it. I'm done.